Good. Um, so, uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome. This is the fourth of our uh, Imagine uh, events, and uh, tonight we're going to hear from the extremely impressive uh, Professor Helen Margins. Um, I'm Alistair Brewer from the Cambridge Commons, which is the group bringing these events to you uh, in collaboration with the Labour History Group. Thank you for asking. Now, um, Imagine 2027 is big picture stuff, but most of what Cambridge Commons does is focused mostly on Cambridge, which was voted recently as the most, or is analysed recently, to be the most unequal city in England on certain criteria. So uh, a lot of work to be done on inequality locally, and if that appeals to you, please see anyone in the batch. There's lots to do. Um, so what's Imagine about? Two things. The first is new ideas. Uh, neoliberalism has dominated for 40 years now, and um, uh, it's not its not all nonsense, but it has uh, divided us a great deal, ramped inequality, and inequality is rotting society. And finally, there's a sort of appetite for change, but we do need to think where, where we can go. And then the second thing is uh, joining dots. Uh, inequality gets into everything. Uh, it infects education, health, housing, and these things are all, uh, they feed each other. So we're going to need holistic solutions, but first we wanted to uh, look at each aspect uh, individually, which is why we've asked uh, a number of independent, uh, highly regarded uh, experts in different fields to to bring their um, experience and use it as a prism through which to imagine a better uh, country in 10 years' time. And uh, tonight, uh, we're going to look at uh, social media in the online world. Uh, our next uh, event is, is going to look at um, uh, racism and sexism by Ava Vidal, who is a comedian. We thought it was quite appropriate coming up to Christmas to, uh, I don't know if she'll be completely serious or very funny or a bit of both, but uh, she's currently in Dominica, uh, where she has so many connections, uh, helping them get over the hurricane. And I, but I, she has assured me she will be back in two weeks' time. So. And, but it, there's a lot of variety to these talks. Next year, we're going to be looking at um, you know, taxation, uh, social mobility, uh, new politics, uh, class, uh, so many different things. And this is why I'm very keen to encourage you to come to as many of these as possible so that, you know, we, we together look at all the connections and build better solutions that, that work. As for tonight, I um, hope you uh, enjoy it and, and also join in. Um, we are a complete shoestring organisation. We're all volunteers, and uh, so we very much appreciate your help. Uh, at the very least, please give us feedback on the forms we've put out. Um, if you want to help us with some cash instead, we love cash, and please just put it in the bucket. Uh, and uh, the other thing we love is new volunteers. There's so much to do, uh, so please, any way you can, um, or take some of the flyers, I don't see any, but we've got a, a, a bit left. And uh, they're going to run out soon because they only cover up to Ava's talk. So if you went to Bomb your uh, office or local street uh, with some of those, that would absolutely be very helpful. So thank you. Uh, final admin points. Uh, there is a book stall outside um, selling not just Helen's uh, book, Political Turbulence, but also um, uh, you know, it's from all the different uh, speakers we've got to show you the variety of, of issues. Uh, the Wi-Fi code and hashtag are here. If there's a fire alarm, it's real. There's an exit there, and this one also works. And we assemble on the screen. And finally, we are recording these, so if that's a problem to anyone, please see someone in the back before you leave. So finally, I'll just introduce our chair, uh, David Howarth, who's been 20 years in politics, local and central, as, as uh, MP for Cambridge, and is now um, Professor of Law and Public Policy at Cambridge University. David's going to chair afterwards, and we'll also now introduce Helen. Thank you very much. So 
Thank you, Alistair. Um, and welcome to the fourth in the series. Uh, tonight's speaker, as Alistair said, is Helen Margits, who is the uh, Professor of Society and the Internet at the University of Oxford, uh, Director of the Oxford Internet Institute, and also um, a fellow of the Turing Institute, which means actually she's not come all the way from Oxford tonight, she's come from just next to King's Cross Station. Um, she has studied the interaction between technology and politics and governance for many years, and um, most recently in the book Political Turbulence, which uh, I also mentioned um, how social media shape collective action, she's moved into political behaviour uh, as well as institutional behaviour. And so, um, um, as she would say, this, this is all about how social media makes politics more chaotic, more turbulent, but not necessarily uh, less predictable. Um, Helen might be a political scientist now. But her background is in maths. And her first job was as a programmer and a systems analyst at Rank Xerox. So that's a background which guarantees you a very warm welcome in Cambridge. <laughs> so, welcome, Helen. Thank you very much, David, and, um, and, and thank, thank you all very much for coming. Um, so, yes, I'm going to talk about um, equality and social media. Um, I guess to many of you that might see, I mean, social media has had such a bad press in the last few years. It's been blamed for fake news, post-truth, extremism, um, radicalization, <coughs> terrorism. Um, there's hardly anything that social media hasn't been blamed for um, in the last um, few years. And if your job title is Professor of Society and the Internet, you're very alive to that. And when there's a plane crash and there's been announced that it was something to do with birds flying into the plane, you, you know that soon somebody's going to wonder if those birds have been radicalized by the Internet. <laughs> um, but anyway, I'm going to do my best. Um, uh, bear with me. Um, So um, when um, uh, uh, Al and, and, and Stuart asked, asked me uh, to, to do this lecture, Al was very keen. He said, you know, this is about positively, thinking about equality in a positive way um, in the year um, 2027. Um, and, and so um, I sort of, you know, adjusted my talk occasion, uh, accordingly. And I sent off my presentation to Al. Um, and he said, oh, well, everybody's going to want to know about fake news and um, <laughs> Russia. You can talk about Russia. Um, and uh, I thought, well, you can't really talk about um, uh, this kind of topic, really, without sort of saying where you stand on, on the sort of um, gloom and doom and pessimism and sort of uh, hopelessly, mind, mindlessly, naively optimistic. You've got to, you know, say where you stand. And I just noticed today, um, and some of you may have seen it, um, an interview with Tim Berners-Lee in The Guardian. Um, where he was asked how he thought, Tim Berners-Lee, of course, the inventor of the World Wide Web, um, asked him, you know, how he thought it was all going, as it were. And he said, I'm still an optimist, but an optimist standing at the top of a hill with a nasty storm blowing in my face, hanging on to a fence. We have to grit our teeth and hang on to the fence and not take it for granted that the web will lead us to wonderful things. And I like that because I thought, well, it's, it's sort of where I, 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 I stand. I, I, there's two, things, two ways in which I differ. I mean, Tim, Tim Berners-Lee, he, he's, he's been very um, sad over the past 10 years about the fact that so many bad people are using the World Wide Web, which was not what was intended at all. Um, and uh, uh, also, of course, he, he, he feels um, sort of in control of it. It has the inventors, kind of, the web will lead us to wonderful things. And I don't think that can be how it would be anyway. It has to be kind of us. Um, us kind of catching up with the web, if you like, and really we're talking about people using the web, not the web itself, driving things along. But anyway, that's more or less um, where, where I stand, and I'll come back to that at the end, perhaps. So this is a kind of um, exam question that I set myself um, uh, over the last 10 years, and it, it, amazingly, it, it really is only 10 years, um, uh, most of the platforms where we all spend, uh, not all, but a vast majority of us are interacting with these platforms on a daily basis. Even where we're not um, actually using a digital platform, any organization that we're interacting with 
probably is using um, so, uh, some many digital platforms. Those platforms are um, collecting data about us, even if we don't interface with them directly, and using that data to make decisions about the goods that they sell us or the services they provide us. Um, and using new sorts of data-intensive tools which haven't been uh, ubiquitous um, in, 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 in society um, before, such as machine learning and artificial intelligence. And all those things have implications. They have implications for almost everything. But what, what do they mean um, for equality? Um, some of what I say will come from the book that's outside, but I, I want to go beyond just political equality and think about equality um, more generally. I hope what I have to say might have a, a kind of message for other sorts of equality that we might um, uh, discuss later. Um, so anyway, this book will explicitly investigate the question of collective action and political participation um, and social media, and I believe that the kind of... Uh, findings of, of that book or the argument of that book would lead us to be hopeful about political equality in 2027. That is, that we might expect that um, uh, some people might be talking about democratic renewal, they might be talking about how many more people are involved in politics than they used to be. Um, uh, it has been uh, very common, particularly in my field, over the last 10, 15 years to say, you know, people don't care about politics anymore, they're not interested in politics, young people are completely disengaged um, um, uh, uh, from politics. Um, but um, I think by, by, by 2027, we might have seen a turnaround, or at least I, I think we could hope for a turnaround. We might be talking about a revival of pluralism as a, as a kind of model of democracy, um, a, 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 a model where we expect there to be kind of continual pressure on states between elections, where people are engaged with, um, uh, with, with states and, and governing organisations um, uh, to deliver public goods um, more equitably, therefore, than before, if more people are involved it suggests um, a, greater, um, a, a greater equity. So that's the kind of, um, that, that's the, the optimistic bit. You know, let's think about, could, could that be the case? Could we see a kind of reversal of some of the trends um, that, that are often um, talked about? Why, why would I even suggest that? Um, well, I would suggest that because something has changed with social media, and that is the availability of tiny acts of politics, tiny acts of political participation, which just weren't available in a pre-social media era. There's no pre-social media equivalent of reading one of Donald Trump's tweets, you might say, <laughs> if only. Um, however, um, I would define that, um, that kind of interest in what a political leader um, is, is saying as some kind of engagement um, with politics. And if you kind of, if you agree that liking something, following someone, um, sharing something, viewing something relating to a political issue, if you, if you buy into the idea that all those things are acts of political participation, then I think we are, you, you, you might agree that, that we are seeing people being drawn, people who didn't used to be anything to do with politics, being drawn into um, political life. I know that's a controversial thing um, to say, um, particularly in this country. In Britain, we have a very, very long-standing culture of politics as pain. Politics is supposed to be painful, it's supposed to... Um, uh, it's supposed to take up time, as Oscar Wilde said, the trouble with socialism, it cuts so dreadfully into the evening. Um, uh, 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 it's supposed to involve meetings, tramping the streets, doing something um, physical and hopefully unpleasant. This is a comment from uh, Tony Wright, um, then chair of the uh, Parliamentary Public Administration um, Select Committee, when I gave evidence to it in 1999. So that's a long time ago, before social media, that's just about the internet. Um, it was a, a session on online political participation that I was giving in. It, 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 
um, <coughs> evidence do, and you can see um, Tony Wright not impressed um, uh, about this idea that you know people just sort of sitting around. I think he said in your pajamas, but I think they, <laughs> they took that out of Hansard. I'm not sure. I don't remember. It's a long time ago. Um, but anyway, this idea that it's something that's too easy. It's too easy. Therefore, it's not politics. Um, and I, I very much do, do not buy, um, I, I don't buy into that idea. Actually, I spoke at an event before where Tony Bright was going to be um, a couple of years ago, um, and I thought I'd play this kind of quote back to him um, to, see, to see what he thought. And I was actually a bit kind of worried about doing that. I thought he might be kind of upset with me sort of reminding him of, of this, you know, after the... Arab Spring and all the kind of waves of demonstration and protests that have been across the world linked to social media. Um, but um, uh, actually, when I when I did, and I even asked some people, do you think you'll mind? And they said, oh no, you're right. And when I read it, he was sort of nodding happily. Yeah, yeah, I was right. Um, so, uh, you know, it's a very prevailing thing in British cult political culture, and I think it's still there, definitely. Anyway, um, the fact is that if you were on, there's just two platforms here, I think there's a bit of Twitter and a bit of Facebook here, um, you can see everywhere, anybody using those platforms is being invited to, um, to, to do something, to watch a video or to like something or to follow something or to look at some trending um, information, <laughs> um, uh, to do something that, that, that is inviting them into <coughs> politics. Um, <coughs> and of course there's advertising here on the right and that's not political advertising but it might be. So platforms like this are um, covered in, in kind of invitations to tiny acts of politics. And those <coughs> tiny acts as they have in, 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 in many, many places can scale up to something um, really dramatic. Um, here's Podemos, the, uh, um, uh, the new force in Spanish politics, born entirely out of a, uh, born out of a movement entirely on social media. Um, now a completely disruptive element of, 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 of Spanish um, politics. Um, here. Um, Here's uh, the March of Millions in Tahrir Square. Um, of course, people there on the street have done more than a tiny act of politics, but it was the accumulation of multiple tiny acts where somebody says that they like something or says that they're going to do something or share something which gives other people a tiny signal of viability of that movement. It makes them a tiny bit more likely to join <coughs> in themselves. So just sharing something in that sense is a political act. Here, of course, those are people, those aren't people, those are people doing quite a big act. Well, they're at a football match, actually, so they're multitasking. Um, but they're sending a signal to the world in this German football stadium that, that refugees are welcome. That photo was hugely shared in the ref refugees crisis of the summer of uh, 2016. Um, and it's impossible not to think that um, even uh, there will have been refugees from uh, war-torn Syria or other countries who see that and might have changed their course of action. Um, research shows that a mobile phone is the one, um, you know, is the most prioritised item um, that refugees um, take them with them <coughs> when they leave, more than blankets or, or even water. Um, and so. Obviously, that, that, that is a possibility that that can happen with tiny acts of participation. It almost doesn't, or it almost always doesn't happen, of course. So um, here is a, a graph of rather less dramatic political mobilisations. Um, these are all um, petitions to the UK government. That's something you can do very easily online now. Um, I, I would think that a lot of people have probably uh, here have signed a digital petition um, which has then been shared and spread across um, social networks. Um, some, some reviewers of articles have called this a, a Rothko graph, so I'm sorry if that's been paid. Basically, what it is is all petitions to the government that normalised to when they first started, um, all the red ones are ones that really didn't go anywhere, you know, got sort of less than 1% of the, 
of, uh, uh, so, sorry, got, got less than 5,000 signatures or 10,000 signatures or something like that. Um, the, only the yellow ones got the 100,000 required for a parliamentary debate. So you can see that almost all of them, and this is a complete data set of every single petition over seven years, almost all of them going absolutely nowhere. So it's important to emphasize that. I'm not trying to suggest here that it's easy to get a million people on the street. Almost all attempts to get a million people on the street actually fail. Um, but the ones that do succeed very dramatically. Here's one of the largest petitions ever, I'd say, a, a, a petition um, to uh, rerun the EU uh, referendum um, <coughs> straight after it in 2016. Some people here may have signed it. I certainly did. Um, uh, <coughs> actually, a petition set up by um, the, uh, uh, the English Democrats, uh, 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 a pro-Brexit uh, organisation, um, they set it up because they thought the referendum was going to have a different result. And, um, and uh, so they, they were saying that if it was very close, I think within 60, 40 or something like that, it should be rerun. Um, of course, it went their way, so um, uh, they didn't want that anymore. But just to save time, some pro-leave um, people pants on the petition, and that's where it goes straight up. So it rolled along. This is a logarithmic scale, so it looks less dramatic than even than it is because it's going up to several million. Um, anyway, um, obviously that one um, didn't, it didn't succeed in changing what happened, but actually there's a, a similarly uh, a, a dramatic and a very similar curve petition for, to ban uh, Donald Trump from having a state visit. And if you think about that petition, possibly a bit more of an effect, because after all, he still hasn't made a state <coughs> visit. And why hasn't he made a state visit? Um, well, because... Um, he thinks there might be demonstrations, and um, a, a petition signed by like four million people is probably quite a good um, a signal that there might indeed be demonstrations. Um, okay, and um, just to emphasize, uh, and I'll come back to that later, um, that, that all these things, they, they, these are mobilizations on, on uh, uh, Twitter and Facebook uh, um, uh, against perceived racist policing in the US, um, which has been uh, grown into a, a huge political movement in the US, and in fact globally. Um, the How Ma uh, the Black Lives Matter um, movement, and um, uh, again, it's, it's a similar sort of going straight up, very dramatic. And there's actually two stages in it. Um, in a lot of these, that's uh, the first one is when the thing itself, when when when, when somebody dies in custody, um, and, and then the next one, a failure to indict the police. But you can see that same sort of dramatic upsurge. Um, so um, what 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 I'm saying here is that. Tiny acts can scale up to something um, really uh, uh, dramatic, which kind of gives all the people involved a tiny share in, in, in that um, uh, possibly large political um, or policy influence. They almost always don't. When they do, it's quite unpredictable. Unpredic pre it's, 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 very, it's very volatile. Um, we don't actually know why some succeed. That data there that I showed of all those petitions, we still don't know, although we've been analysing it for a long time, we still don't really know um, what it is that makes one succeed and one not. Um, uh, in, in that dra graph I showed you, there's three petitions there in favour of badgers um, to, protect ba uh, to, to end the cull of badgers. Um, one of them got over 100,000 and there was a debate in Parliament. One of them got like 3,000, and one of them got less than 10. Very, very different fates for very similar um, petitions for the same thing at a roughly similar time. So quite volatile, um, uh, quite, almost seemingly quite random, dependent on luck. Um, and that's, uh, is that equality? It's a kind of um, equality, but not a very um, satisfactory <coughs> one. But the point is that, I think you can argue that there's a lot more possibility that someone with hardly any resources, with none of the resources traditionally associated with political participation, can actually fight injustice or, or campaign for change um, much more easily than they could before. So, that's political equality. Could that same argument have any, make any suggestions about social or economic 
equality. Um, well, I'd like to just suggest there, perhaps for the discussion, that, that, that the answer might be yes. We don't really know the answer to that question, um, and I'll say why um, in a minute. This is uh, just a few um, uh, snippets from a, a British Academy funded project um, going on at the Oxford Internet Institute. Um, uh, interviews with 40 adult internet users who use the internet reasonably regularly but live in households with a, with a low income, below 20,000 a year, um, and located in one of the 20% most deprived um, areas um, in Britain. These are the kind of motivations that the interviewees um, report for using the internet, improving their job situation or economic pros uh, prospects, addressing so social isolation, um, getting kind of involved politically, um, and enhancing knowledge um, and awareness. Those were the kind of motivations that they gave. So, um, first of all, um, is there a sense in which tiny acts on social media and other platforms, I want to broaden it out a bit now, social media are the primary sort of place that political activity has been affected by, um, uh, by digital platforms, but um, when it comes to... Um, uh, 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 um, uh, uh, when it comes to uh, when, when it comes to enterprise um, uh, uh, and, and actually m making a small amount of money or being a, a little bit of a bed and breakfast owner, um, platforms like Airbnb are really opening up, um, and the rest of the platforms of the sharing economy are opening up um, political, uh, sorry, uh, opening up enterprise possibilities um, for um, ordinary people. Um, we're seeing that on Airbnb, people are, are renting out accommodation which they probably would never have thought of doing if it wasn't for that platform. Um, eBay is home to hundreds of thousands of, uh, of, of small businesses, um, uh, as, is, as is Amazon. Um, and Instagram is home to hundreds of thousands of, of, of uh, what are called micro-influencers, people who um, place who have a certain amount of, of followers on that platform, often quite young people, or, 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 or mothers at home, or, 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 or carers of some kind, um, and, and uh, uh, are, are given the possibility to, once they get a certain number of followers and a certain amount of popularity, are offered by companies the possibility of sponsoring sort of carefully chosen project, products. And this isn't people who end up, you know, as kind of major celebrities. These are people who've got sort of a certain number of followers, less than 100,000 followers, um, who are then invited to advertise products and can make some money. It's not an easy thing to do at all. Um, and again, um, I would expect, we don't have the data for this, but I would expect to see sort of similar patterns um, for, for political activity, but it's still something that's more possible to more people um, than it was before, the idea of doing a little bit of a business enterprise. Um, the same applies to employment, um, and this is possibly something, um, uh, obviously it's slightly controversial to say that um, people are more free to be totally exploited um, by a digital platform like Uber or Amazon Mechanical Turk or Upwork, these are the sort of micro labour platforms. Uber, of course, is a platform for um, uh, uh, for, for for taxi drivers. Um, but the fact is, it is possible, like it's never been possible before, to do little packets of work that can be fitted around other things or each other. To kind of build a job out of tiny little bits of a job. Um, and I do think that there could be senses in which that's um, uh, 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 actually offering um, greater equality um, in, in, in employment, sort of opportunities, job employment opportunities to non-elites. Um, Helen? Yeah? I'm told by a colleague that the reason the thing keeps jumping forward is we've got something set wrongly. Um, if it's it's not bugging me, but if it's bugging you, we, we can take a one minute. <laughs> I've, only got, um, I've only got a, a couple more slides that okay. I think we're, so we're, we're probably all right. I do apologise. 
so the 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 idea. I, I mean, this is explicitly geared at the idea of sort of fitting work around caring responsibilities or, or other bits of work or combining with the possibilities of enterprise. But it also relates to access to employment networks. I mean, LinkedIn is, of course, um, uh, uh, the kind of professional platform for people who want access, uh, who, who are offering access to kind of professional networks. But there's all sorts of other platforms where, where people can do job search among appropriate, uh, sort of appropriately matched, um, um, matched organisations. Was another one, never mind. Um, uh, social inequality, the question of, of tackling um, social um, isolation. I mean, that's that's uh, broadly in the in the sort of social media um, uh, 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 frame. And what we've seen over recent years is a sort of diversification of, of, of platforms and a sort of more, you, you know, most younger people have left. Facebook, apart from the dummy account they had so that their parents could think they knew what they were doing. Um, Snapchat now is actually used by, I think it's 50% of 15 to 34 year olds. Um, so mammoth numbers um, on Snapchat and anybody here with teenage children will know that um, uh, that it, it becomes almost um, a part of, they become sort of digital humans for a while. Um, while they take endless pictures of their jawbone and post it to all their friends. Um, but I, I think, uh, it, you know, certainly um, this interview evidence and this whole uh, raft of other ev evidence that these platforms are offering some kind of, um, uh, uh, some kind of possibilities of overcoming, if not creating social equality, of overcoming some well-known social inequalities, particularly um, sort of social isolation, social poverty, um, if you like, um, particularly for people who find it difficult um, to get out, particularly in terms of matching people um, with similar interests or, or with similar health problems, uh, perhaps people who share experiences. Um, and, 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 and here's a quote from somebody who, um, who had a lot of problems, including um, um, mental illness. Um, a feeling that the internet was sort of opening up a world to them. Um, there, there's lots of examples of, like that. And finally, um, the idea of, of tiny acts scaling up to some kind of um, education opportunities that weren't there before. The, the same as, the, uh, 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 as politics, the idea that you can break up um, the idea of a doing a whole course or something like that into very small things which might scale up to a new skill or new sorts of expertise. Even like even things like um, watching YouTube videos to learn how to do something, um, DIY or painting or, 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 or something like that, to actually doing whole online um, courses. Also to sort of finding your way around a field that you might want to um, apply for a, for a job in or something like that to kind of get an understanding of it um, and, and to understand what's going on. Um, just simple things like using search engines and things like that. All those things offer some sort of possibility of this um, scaling up. Now, there's the kind of optimistic picture um, and obviously that is, that is very optimistic and as I said, there's various reasons why we don't know very much about how plausible what I've been talking about is. Because most of, ironically, because most social media platforms, um, uh, uh, all, all, all digital platforms in fact, are basically, uh, are based on huge quantities of your data um, that you provide to those platforms, and that's how they work. Uber is just, uh, 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 is just a huge, huge um, data pool of data about drivers and data about passengers and data about journeys. That's all it is. But none of that data is available um, outside Uber. And the same applies to most social um, media platforms. 
I mean, as, as, a, uh, as a political scientist researcher, um, that's an incredibly frustrating fact. We've got more data about, the more data exists about political life than ever in, in ever. Um, every single thing that I've mentioned and that you do, um, that's got, when you've gone anywhere near your phone, um, is, is recorded in some digital trace. But most of that data is not available. You'll hear a lot about it. You'll hear a lot of people, um, uh, you'll hear a lot of items on the news talking about, I don't know, fake news and um, Russian bots, etc. Most of it's based on, on, on Twitter data, because Twitter is one of the very few platforms that has an open interface. Um, but nearly all the other platforms don't have any sort of open data. Facebook data is, is proprietary. There is a little bit available about public um, posts, but most of it is completely um, behind, um, behind Facebook's walls. Um, Snapchat data is, the, their marketing sort of uh, 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 offer is that they delete all the data as soon as, it's, um, as soon as it's been read. So even if they had the data, they couldn't say they had. Um, uh, and WhatsApp is encrypted and so on. Instagram belongs to Facebook, so does WhatsApp. Um, and so on and so on. So all these, nearly all these platforms are proprietary. And that means most of the data that would enable me to sort of tell you that this is really, uh, this is, these are trends that are kind of set to 2027, um, that these are all growing phenomena, um, doesn't exist. We have to find out other ways of, of looking at it. And of course we are, but um, um, it, is, um, it is a challenge. I, I mean, if, if you, you ask me, if I was writing a paper about Snapchat, um, and I wanted to do a literature review, it would have about three papers in it. I know of two academics who are working on it. Um, so there's a, a long way to go before we actually understand um, this environment. But of course, there are threats out there, and we do know something about them, and um, we, 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 we certainly hear a lot about them. One of them is fake news, the propagation of misinformation. Um, this is definitely a phenomenon, um, ranging from deliberately misleading to inaccurate um, information produced for all sorts of um, motivations to make money. Um, uh, through advertising revenue to, um, to uh, uh, propaganda uh, geared at another, another country's um, election. Computational propaganda um, uh, uh, ranges from automated accounts that are completely automated and behave as if human and um, uh, uh, convince other users that they are human, not just by producing posts themselves, but also by liking and sharing and, and um, tweeting things and so on, which then fools other people to thinking that other things are more popular than they really are. Computational propaganda is a definite um, phenomenon. Echo chambers and filter bubbles, the idea that um, in social media platforms we are, um, uh, we, we exist in sort of personalized environments where, um, uh, where, 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 where we receive the, the kind of daily me every day, we just receive news that we're interested in, we don't see people outside our own ideological bubble. Um, and indeed, it's true that social media platforms do, uh, I mean, that's how they're designed. They're designed to keep you happy. Facebook wants to keep you happy, it wants to keep you on the platform. So it doesn't want to tell you things you don't like. Um, some commentators, like the legal scholar Cass Sunstein, says this is really what's going to bring the end of democracy um, and that we'll never have any sort of democratic conversation going again. You know, that really is democracy finished. That, that is Kassan's view. Um, I think we don't know nearly enough about um, echo chambers and, 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 and filter bubbles, and that um, there's, uh, I think Facebook have, have published some things about it, but of course <coughs> you don't know what they would have published if they hadn't liked the results, but I mean what they have published suggests that, you know, it's, it's uh, that, that, that kind of, that there are lots of counter pressures to, to, to um, echo chambers, and I think there's quite a lot of evidence for that too. I mean, um, that screen I showed you at the beginning of the, you, you know, you've quite often got something just waiting 
to um, puncture your, your filter bubble. If you, uh, if you want a real filter bubble, it would be just reading the Daily Mail in the 1930s. That would be perfect. I think that is the sort of gold star of filter bubbles. Um, another person who's in a filter bubble is Donald Trump. He just follows, he only uses Twitter. Um, he follows 43 people, um, uh, mostly alt right journalists and his own family. Um, so he, and, and then he watches Fox News. So he's in quite a good filter bubble. But in general, I think that if you, if you use social media platforms in a more normal way, um, you're likely to have your bubble burst. But as I say, you know, it's something that we need to understand better. Hate, bullying, and trolling um, is something that's very much been um, kind of uh, uh, the, the uh, social media platforms are very much associated with those things, and there's no doubt that we see it. I think there is a fear that a whole generation of women could, could be discouraged from public life by the kind of um, hate that they get online. Um, so it's a serious phenomenon. What we don't, we don't know that much about the sort of scale and scope of it. Um, we don't know kind of how many people are involved. We're doing a lot of research on that at the Oxford Internet Institute and in many, many other universities, I'm sure, here as well. Um, but it's, it's, it's definitely a sort of counter equality pressure. And then, of course, um, what um, some people are called kind of tiny acts of, 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 of cyber war. Um, some people believe that the kind of acts that Russia are perpetrating on, uh, in the Ukraine on all aspects of their infrastructure um, via um, digital mechanisms is actually, you know, well, the two countries are at war anyway, really, um, but um, they're, they're, they're kind of practicing um, for the US that, you know, that will be the next thing, that they're kind of scaling up um, to a war level um, of cyber, uh, cyber attacks. So all these are things that need tackling. I mean, it's, it's, um, it's not surprising. <coughs> Social media, as I said, have only been around for the last 10 years. Um, I think we're going to have to spend the next 10 years kind of accepting that they are institutions in our democracy, in our society, in our economy, and working out how to kind of institutionally catch up. Um, we are going to have to um, regulate some things. We are going to have to... And, um, put pressure on social media corporations to go far, far further than they have in tackling um, fake news, um, um, hate, um, computational propaganda, etc. If echo chambers are such a problem, there are easy design mechanisms that could be used to work against them. All these things are possible, um, and some of them are beginning to happen, but it will require a lot of pressure on social media corporations who, after all, want to keep everybody happy. They want to keep us there. Um, so, you know, we have a kind of stick, as it were. We have, have some sort of stick. But it will require kind of constant attention, um, in, 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 in my view. So, just to finish, I mean, those are the, uh, the, the, those are the pressures to in, in inequality, which I think we will... We should spend the next 10 years kind of, kind of um, um, thinking about and tackling. Um, one of them is regulatory um, decay. Um, <coughs> digital platforms uh, present a huge challenge to, go to states wanting um, to regulate activity on them. Look at Uber, um, no data. Um, so what happens? You get this, um, you know, revoking of the license in London of, of Uber because there's no way to tackle the potential sort of human right. You know how to, um, in any way, ensure that workers' rights are protected, um, and, and that was the kind of response of, of, of Transport for London. But it's kind of, you know, it's understandable because there's no mechanism to do the normal um, functions of a regulator. <coughs> Institutionally tackling um, the real social media pathologies once we've worked out which are, what they are. The questions of algorithms and bias is going to be a huge issue for equality over the next um, uh, uh, over the next ten years. Where machine learning, data intensive innovations like machine learning and artificial intelligence are already used for things like sentencing and deciding who gets bail. Um, in, 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 in the US, and those algorithms have already been shown to be biased um, uh, from a, 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 a racial perspective, for example. 
Um, and we're going to have to really take that on board. That is the fastest growing um, activity in my department, um, is, is digital ethics. The ethics of data and data science um, and digital platforms. Um, we we uh, recruited the lone philosopher, Luciano Faridi, um, three years ago, and now he's got a team of 12, all working on that um, issue. And finally, the, the, you know, there is this question um, of, 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 of volatility. I mentioned at, at, at the early part this point that political activity and kind of social trends more generally, but, but fastening on the, on the political point, um, that, that politics is much more um, volatile and uh, unpredictable than it has been before. Now, in that kind of environment where you've got kind of issues and, um, and, and people kind of fighting for attention, um, it's a kind of, it, it's an environment that over and over again, when it's in a digital setting based on online networks, has shown itself to be prey to a winner-takes-all phenomenon. You see that in music, for example. Um, take the uh, singer Ed Sheeran. Um, how many people here have heard The Shape of You? It's an unusual <laughs> demographic for that, perhaps. Okay, so Ed Sheeran, The Shape of You has been listened to, has been streamed over a billion times on Spotify, on that one platform alone. Um, which is, it, 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 which to me is extraordinary. And you see this pattern in cultural, uh, we know from various um, research, you see this pattern in cultural markets few number of really, really extreme events and then lots and lots of insignificant people, you know, uploading videos on YouTube. And, 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 and that, it seems to me, is not a, not a good pressure for, for uh, not a good pressure that's going to sort of favour equality. So we've got to understand that and find ways of using um, data to, um, uh, to, to work out what's happening and to mitigate inequality.